Basically, Ben is amazing. Many years ago, when you were all in your cradles, Ben came up to me and was my first co-organizer on Net Squared Vancouver after I'd taken it on, um, until he went to Victoria like a jerk, <laughs> leaving some room for Chad to come back. But uh, he's gone on from there and created one of like the most sort of fun, significant, like mover and shaker consultancies that's really focused around online giving. And because there's lots of consultants out there who will make you a pretty website, um, but very few of them have got the deep expertise around online giving. So Ben and Frontier are going to tell you what's going on. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. It's Ben Johnson. Thank you. First thing is that I'm colorblind. And so when we talk about reviewing websites, that would be a, a thing. And so our other two researchers, I point out, aren't. The second is I'm a professional accountant. So that means I have a very skewed view of things. And the third one, of course, being that I work at a marketing agency and not within a nonprofit. And of course, when I observe all the other charity websites, those are, those are three strong themes that will be part of kind of the lens that we view these charities. And, and it's all to say that as much as we try to create a very objective view at everything, those are, of course, very strong themes that would be kind of working into the human nature of who we are. All right, see? Like I said, if you see the number seven, you are not colorblind. Uh, if you don't, welcome to the club. <laughs> and here we go. So, one of the things we did was we spent about three months, or 90-ish days, studying 92 charities that are of affiliation with the Canadian Council of Christian Charities. So essentially we just chose a tribe of people, deeply examined them, and some of you noted, uh, we gave about 10-ish dollars donations because quite often we'd find that a $5 donation wasn't good enough for them. And instead of 55 small bullet points, we tried to break them into five big themes for you today. And we're going to have an experiential part of the evening in a few minutes, which is going over a very academic thing called a rubric. And one of the things that we found very useful about it was it's a, the process of applying something that's very uh, objective to something as a, like performance appraisals or uh, observing websites that's generally very subjective. And not only did we want to do something like create a score, we wanted to have it well defined at what that score meant. So some things had a 4 out of 4 rating, and then we had to put the time in to say a 4 out of 4 around this, say uh, provide suggested amount or a default amount, means this specifically, versus a 1 out of, or a 2 out of 4 means this specifically. So any one of our researchers could have a very uh, defined view of what a 2 out of 4 is. So when we talk about data, ironically enough, there's even more room for subjectivity if you don't define what a 2 out of 4 is. So you can imagine our process when we ended up coming up with 55 of these points on our donor experience rubric, and we had different weightings for the different items, which led to uh, this, which is some fun data here called the scatter plot. On the one side, the y-axis, you see the, our design score of all the charities, and on the x-axis is the donor experience score. Uh, largely, you can see the trend was most people didn't do very well. Um, there was three organizations that we thought did outstanding, and therefore, that probably was an outlier. When we got rid of them, we came up with my favorite stat of the last year, which is called the Pareto Frontier. And it is because of obvious reasons why I like that stat. But you may have heard of the Pareto Principle, or like the 80-20 rule. This one is a little bit different in that um, when there isn't a clear regression, which is to say really bad to really good, these are all over the map, when there isn't a very clear thing, there becomes this frontier of two optimal choices, a very well-designed website or a very pro-donor experience website. And, and what we've noticed was there was a very clear trade-off. And so part of this presentation is the hope that that's not a truth, that there isn't a trade-off between great design and great donor experience. Or what we noticed was uh, the design agency charity website and the sort of database-driven charity website. And, and so let's go through these points on how we can make the websites the, the best of both worlds. Number one, it's kind of been drilled into you at this point, I think. Don't need to shame you anymore. <laughs> but don't phone it in when it comes to mobile. We noticed that the majority of these websites just a slight majority, did not have mobile responsive websites. 
which means at the very least, if you grab the browser on your desktop and shrink it, it should be adjusting the content accordingly. And our, our rubric was quite specific about this, that it wasn't good enough that it did just adjust. It should be very specific to what a donor who's looking on your mobile phone is wanting to experience. And this was especially important when we gathered other stats. For instance, 25% of all web users are now exclusively mobile. Not just, I prefer a mobile phone or I have one in my back pocket, exclusively mobile. And the second one being that among our client group, we saw 200 to 400% growth in, in mobile giving in the last year. And, and this was websites that were already you know, good, but not optimized. And then we found a killer stat, which is when a website is responsive, giving on mobile devices doubles. So we ain't got budget for that, but you could say, here's the revenue now, here's the revenue we'd expect when the website becomes more mobile responsive. And if you've been paying attention to Google News, now PageRank is going to be affected by how mobile friendly your website is. So even if someone knows your domain and then they Google yourcharity.ca into Google, it might be punished because it's not a mobile friendly website. Now, speaking of, so not the greatest uh, contrast right now, but in our report, which anyone is free to contact us to, to access, we gave a good co compare and contrast to a very mobile specific view when you're donating to one that isn't. And, and it isn't much better on this one if you're actually using your phone. And if you have to pinch ever, then that's a bad thing. So what are some practical takeaways when it relates to mobile? For one, Google has a tool where you can go and access the website and say, is my website mobile friendly? Uh, secondly, one of the things I, I recommend in any discussion, if someone says, oh, we need another seven more paragraphs on or about us to tell a, the potential donor more about what we do because we're so amazing, we're the best nonprofit ever. And then you say, okay, let's pull out our smartphones and let's see how much content that really looks like. Because most of you might be sitting around with old PCs and looking at the monitor and say, oh, of course, there's a lot of room for, for more content on the website. But that's not true for those 25% of your, all your users. Secondly, fast hosting. When you think about it, how much it matters, on when we were all trying to give a donation, how slow even just the Wi-Fi was when it was just overloaded. Like, and we're part of an exercise. If a donor is giving to a charity website and it's just too slow on the mobile device, it's, it's done. Um, secondly, and, or thirdly, uh, this kind of relates to um, two related things, which is break, breaking tasks into smaller steps. So if you're thinking that we want a very long form or we want uh, one big page, just the idea of, of sort of breaking content down is a good strategy. And then tied in with the fact that if you're thinking about giving, just try and reduce the number of taps. And, and the important lesson that uh, you know, donors don't have to give. They're, they're not getting anything out of it except for a tax receipt. All right, next. Tell me how much to give. Now, um, I have the stats sort of buried somewhere, but uh, one of the things that we did notice was the majority of charities were not telling us where the donation went, uh, such as meals or uh, to provide a night of shelter, and these were charities that did that such thing. And then we also noticed that most of them did not uh, give any specific um, designation of where the funds would go, and, and every charity is required to do that from a CRA perspective. But as donors, we were searching the site, and it wasn't very clear as part of the giving process of, of how to do it. And so we have these two stats. Um, there we go. Uh, here is a great example of a US-based charity that articulates what we would call in fundraising a case for support, but they do it actually four times. And so if you go to the Saturday Place website, they, they have multiple giving amounts from you know, the basics at under $250 to, hey, I'm interested in giving 1,000 to 2,500. Does that fund something different? And the answer for them was yes. And that could have been, from a design perspective, done very terribly. Uh, it could have been download this PDF to read about you know, $1,000 and more gifts or phone us because we don't think you should give on a credit card. Um, what we found here was there was two methods. One was selecting at the top. The other one was a beautiful little slider. And all the colors changed based on the, the different giving amount. All right. So this is my anecdotal story time. Um, since we brought up race earlier in the day, I described this as 
uh, Phenocean White right now. I spent a lot of time in Phoenix recently, and um, not all of it was by choice. I uh, immediately upon la landing in Phoenix, I had my passport, my passport in my back pocket, which is not a good idea. And uh, immediately upon landing, I walked off and got into the house I was staying at and realized I didn't have my passport with me anymore. And uh, it turns out America is a different country, that you need documentation. And uh, so it was this wild story of planes, trains, and automobiles that got me to the sort of the Washington state border where I took a ferry and, and then begged to be let back in. And, and when, uh, the, the whole thing was going while I was making this presentation. And there's this other side to giving, which is having your accountability documents ready. And uh, the whole thing about donors can often be like customs agents. It's, it's not the end of the world, but just please have your documents ready if we ask. And we noticed that, unfortunately, the majority of those charities who pay funds to get the seal of approval for accountability by the Canadian Council of Christian Charities on their website didn't have things like um, Trustmark or uh, annual report or financial reports. Or if we looked for the annual report, it had to be within the last couple years, not five or seven years ago. And, and even just something like a privacy policy, where it's like, just, just have some basic documentation. Not everyone's looking, but there will be a portion of your audience that just wants to see a glimpse. Um, I may have forgotten a good slide. Uh, yeah, so it was 20 of the charities had absolutely nothing, not even a registered charity number at the footer. And then another charity, uh, 20 out of the 92, had everything, and it was great. And so what it seemed to be it was a tale of two extremes. Here is an example of the Livestrong Foundation. And I think you can imagine this is a charity that's struggling to maintain credibility, right? <laughs> They've got a spokesperson that isn't doing them any favors right now. And so when I go to give, that might be a sensitivity. And they did a great job when we were touring sort of good samples of showing here's how your money is spent. Within that, here's the programs that it goes to. And I think in general in the States, there's this, the big charities that, that don't do enough for the actual program work. That, that I can imagine a Livestrong has to live it every day of the, the overhead paradigm, right? All right. This was actually while I was walking to the airport. And, and, and anyways. So uh, there is uh, my, my favorite marketer is Seth Godin. Um, and he blogs every single day. And while I was making this report, he had a great one, which is uh, the first rule of web design. And, and he says, it's tell me where to click. And I think this is particularly relevant in nonprofits uh, because there often doesn't seem to be a particular theme or reason why I'm going to be giving. Uh, there isn't necessarily a um, sort of core purpose for the website. You know, we've got our programs, our comms, and our fundraising, and it's this shared commons for a website. But the thing that's unfortunate is, like, it leaves the, the potential donor or, or any potential visitor without anyone being that primary stakeholder. And, and so when you don't use things like bright colors, for us that are color deficient, or if you don't use shapes and, and sort of any sort of visual way of design to tell me the purpose, it, it actually is quite confusing to go to a website if you don't navigate it every day. And I think that's one thing to remember is that your donors don't work at your organization. Like they don't put 40 hours a week into being a donor. They put maybe five hours a year, if you're lucky, into being a donor. And that's if you visit them and sit down and take up their time. And, and so one of the things I loved about this blog post is being someone in technology helping nonprofits is the statement that he says, which is get the language right and the colors. Tech isn't going to fix your problem, communication is. So I hope that's one of those practical things that you can take away is that we're not necessarily saying you need to upgrade your website, is you need to often upgrade your language that you're using. You need to have a much clearer purpose for why the website exists and to use things like shapes, sizes, colors, and not just more content or prettier images. And a humble brag. Uh, Here is an example, and I hope, because I sat at the back most of the time, I hope you can see this, is um, this, here's two websites that we've built. And one of the things that we make sure to do is when we're thinking about the donate button, because often if you use Frontier, it's for a kind of a donor-centric fundraising. 
which is a bit contentious here. Um, but we make sure to grab a color out of their palette, and that is the only color that is ever allowed to use for a donation call to action. So for instance, you might be filling in a form to volunteer for UGM. That'll be a blue button. It could be a green button. Oh, but no, only if it's fundraising. And, and, and that's not to say that green is the perfect color, because over here, there's the Calgary Dream Center, and they have a different color palette, and red can only be used as a button for giving. And, and we might think of ourselves as very advanced creatures, particularly if you're not like me and you don't have a bump in your ear. And, uh, but we're not. If we're on the website, it's fight or flight. And if you're not using color to give subtle signals, well then, goodbye. All right, so trying to keep it practical here. What are some of the things that you can do? Uh, to minimize distractions. And so this, this was a very important, like these were all multiple elements within the rubric. And so the first one being under 20 ways to leave the donate page without making a donation. So if you go to your slash give or slash donate, you count all the links like about us or, you know, read more stories. Uh, here is our, you know, contact us. And like just how many other links are on that donate page? Uh, Twitter, Facebook. You know, read our, our latest LinkedIn post. All those things are channels away from giving. And in theory, like th that content can be on every other subpage of your website. But if I click slash donate, I might have a particular intent. And all those other things are, are, are just anti-selling. So related, and I love that we had that segment on mobile giving, is try and have 13 or fewer fields on a checkout page. And that excludes if like, I'm a business or I want to give in memorial or honor. So we started counting every single field of those 100 charities. And we found that it was quite uncommon to have 13 or fewer. And, and it's not that it is the end of the world. And, and much of this, none of this is the end of the world. Um, but if you want to have 3 to 5% more donations, if you'd like to have 5 to 7% more donations, it's often a series of little things like making sure that when someone is on a mobile form, Form, mobile phone donating on your form that there isn't over 20 fields for them to fill in because your database administrator said, hey, like we can ask Mr. Mrs. We can ask uh, how did you find out about us? All those things are a potential um, sort of moment of giving up for a donor. Uh, related is we, thought, uh, we found some research around having a simplified header or footer on the donate page and checkout. And so again, you might not be thinking like, oh wow, like I have the same footer, which is like a table of contents that has so many items on every page of my website, including the donate page, including the checkout. But, but why? Yeah, again, that's more distractions. Uh, another one, and we, <laughs> there's actually one organization that kinda we wanted to put this in for, which is please put a highly legible font on your checkout. Please do not use comic scans. Please don't use script. <laughs> Again, like, I'm colorblind, I need glasses, and you use a funny script for your checkout? Like, just stop. And, and then it's not like it was part of their brand, either. So, next, and um, I do not represent any payment providers. Um, I think you should make sure that the, sort of the, the link that you use to talk about donating should be very human, and it should be part of your website's domain. And, and because there is so much research, both in e-commerce and in giving, that says, if I go from yourcharity.org to notyourcharity.com, there's a moment of not understanding. And if I'm the typical donor that's over 60 years old and doesn't love giving online all the time, I'm not a philanthropist, there's just a moment of, of wondering. And, and if it's yourcharity.org slash 1234abc.aspx, and you say, wow, it's an old website, it's .net, and all these techie reasons, what you've basically done is just had slightly less human language. And so when you think about the technology you're using, is just how is it helping me be more human? And there's another moment. Um, we call this a little pro tip, is it's entirely possible to generate the uh, city and province um, information if you already have the postal code. So what we often uh, suggest is if you put in your street name and your postal code, it then pre-fills the next two field being that your city and your province. And though it wouldn't technically make it 13 or fewer fields, what it does is it's just assisting the donor along. All right, so 
this example before, so hopefully, you know, at least the first six tables can see this fairly well. Um, good example of case for support. Lots of distracting elements, if you could see it fully. If we eliminated those and even added more points, like how to give monthly and that sort of thing, then, then how much more simple does this page look? Right? Like we take a look, you know, they have the donate button at the top. Well, that's not actually part of the donate process, so let's get rid of it. And if you could actually see it, uh, we put a little lockbox there saying this site is secure. Um, here happens to be one of our sponsors. Great job, Chimp. Let's see you tweeting over there. Um, a 404 page. Uh, we're often hesitant to talk about these in the tech world because people say, like, what's a 404 page? I think among nonprofits and charities, this is an incredibly important page. Uh, we often talk about stewardship as an activity. Um, so say, say you send me a tweet saying, uh, go to you know, yourcharity.org slash Ben, and you misspell my name, and I end up on your 404 page. Uh, maybe I make a mistake and don't know how to spell Ben. I end up on the 404 page. You make mistakes. I make mistakes. So this it will be the landing spot for any mistake that happens, both from a spelling error or a page used to exist, and then it got deleted, and then someone clicks on the link that still exists. And um, what are you going to do for every person that makes a mistake on their behalf, or every person that clicks a link when you've made a mistake? And we went through a lot of these charity websites, and, and they were terrible. There was no suggested action to take next. For instance, we could say, you know, hey, learn more about us. Uh, you know, here's a phone number if you're really tech literate. Um, and, and I think a lot of the charities just didn't know this page existed. Um, and uh, there was one in particular that was quite obvious. Um, please be sure to check that there is no explicit content on your 404 page. <laughs> All right. Often, Net Squared or Net Tuesday conversations are all about technology, but fundraising, online or off, is never really about technology, and it's also not a rational one. So one of the things we say, to give is an emotional decision and not a rational one. So some things to avoid doing is add to cart. If I am inspired, yesterday was my, my six-year-old daughter's birthday, I potentially would have wanted to go to a site like World Vision or Plan Canada, and, and I want to sponsor a child who's six years old somewhere else in the world. I do not want to add to cart. <laughs> I cannot be serious enough and say that, like, do not productize your giving experience. And, and technology from 1998, of course, it's e-commerce. You have to buy something, especially become a monthly donor even still. But, but it, it should be a, a, a sort of sacred law to keep things human in this sense. Similarly, do not submit. That's, again, an old tech word uh, when you create a, a submit button, right? Um, why not give now, donate now, uh, help today? We noticed that, uh, and it's shown later, St. Jude's Hospital inspired us where they put the amount that you're giving in the donate button. And so that's been applied to most of our charities that we work with, that it even further aids in communication. It's like, donate this amount now with a large button. Next, no more CAPTCHA. Please, please don't make me, like, again, colorblind, glasses. And I, like, I'm not even in my 60s, 70s, and 80s yet. And, and technology now is improving to the point where if you work with a proper payment provider, their fraud protection should keep you safe from ever having to fight off robots. And, and this one might be up in the air, but no review and confirm step. Uh, one of the things that does is it actually does re reduce the amount of people who are giving, especially if they're not tech savvy, that they think they're done. Don't ask for money to pay for credit card fees. Um, again, this is payment provider biased. Um, but I, I think one of the things that's okay when you're purchasing groceries is, is say, hey, how about $2 for food banks? But if what they say, like, hey, you know, how about another $5 for our processing fees? Or like you're, you're going to buy that beautiful engagement ring for your, your, your husband's wife, spouse, and they say, hey, you know, like, it's quite expensive for us to use your Amex, sir. Um, would you mind giving us an extra $200? <laughs> there goes that emotional experience, right? But you do it all the time with some charity websites, we noticed. Like, hey, we're poor, please. Three more dollars. And one of the things you didn't realize is that this was one of the best parts of my day. Like, I'm giving to a charity today for a cause I love, 
just remember that that person's in the moment when you're deciding on your technology. Similarly, just choose an email address like donors at your charity.org or we love you donors or just, just it's an easy accessible change instead of, you know, mailer demon or however it's pronounced or do not reply at our charity.org. <laughs> and the last one being related to that is try and personalize it. You go to a thank you page, it's like thank you for your billing. And it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I, I think I was spending money and it's obvious now. Or trying to think of it as a thank you letter. You can see, like, you can't see it, but like my name's there, the one dollar that I was able to donate in that case. And, and it clearly tells me a next step. Because it's like, if I gave you that five dollars right now, you'd be like, thank you, Ben. Um, do you know our charity well? What else do you know? Like, what else could you know about us? And maybe read our annual report because we have a copy online. And also, the email confirmation is an opportunity to, to take a next step with them and be personal. Here's the St. Jude example. They did such a great job. Uh, one of the things as a pro tip is called inline validation. And I won't spend any time talking about that because it's even more intense than talking about 404 pages. But when you hit donate and, and you made a mistake, it's going to shame you most of the time. So when you go to that checkout page, like somewhere on the page, there's a mistake. Find it. Versus, <laughs> hey, tell us your first name. That, that's when I, I moved from first name to last name. I was like, hey, hey, hold on. Before you go any further, you're missing something. You're not stupid. <laughs> We're not judging, but please fill in your first name. And then, as you can see there, donating $9.79. As a bonus, I notice here they have donate at stjude.org. They're a member of the Better Business Bureau. I can trust them. All right, five principles to take away from this presentation is, or the today, if you don't care about mobile at the end of the day, whew, there's nothing we can do. All right. <laughs> Second, I am a technologist, but I am a fundraiser first. Giving is an emotional experience, not a rational one. And we hope that these charities would create a transformational experience, not a transactional experience. Secondly, ask specific amounts. Even if it's saying, please donate $50, but here's what $50 does. There's 11 ducks that now don't have oil on them. Or we're all ducks, your $50 means we're all better in some way. Just try. Um, next, show your documentation for the most particular donors. Doesn't have to look great, right? Lastly, lead users through color, simplicity, and good design. And I wanted to leave with one quote that I absolutely love, which applies to charity websites. Less but better. There we go. That's me. <laughs> All right. So... This was a presentation sponsored by the Seacrest Foundation. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of you in our attendance. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do, uh, so a report is coming out at digitalcharity.ca, or if you go to the frontier.io slash blog, you'll see an article about today's presentation. Um, but we've been asked to spend that 90 days uh, going through and creating this objective process for analyzing charity websites which I believe does apply to you all because, as someone said, you're all the same. And um, here is a shortened or condensed version of the, the rubric. And so you guys get to spend some time going over your charity's website and, and sort of determining where you sit uh, on these several points. To give yourself the best chance, you, you probably hope that you have a desktop or a laptop computer here. Otherwise, you might actually be doing this process from a mobile device, which will make it even more painful. So just to spend one second going over the process one more time, what is the item in the best practice? For instance, go to google.ca. If you don't know what incognito mode is, uh, the private browsing, using Firefox, Chrome, that sort of thing. Hopefully one person in your group does, or otherwise look around and wave at someone, and be like, do you know what incognito mode is? Um, and, and do a Google search for your charity or nonprofit. And does an ad for your charity come up? If not, you do not have the Google AdWords grant, and you should be shamed. Um, one of the things as the rubric was, does an ad for another charity come up? But Basically, go from the best to the worst and answer the questions. And if you have questions, ideally, someone standing up will try and help.
All right, we now have to put down your pens and pencils. No more scorekeeping. Was there any takeaways? What did you learn? Were there any wow moments? Does anyone have anything they'd want to put their hand up and share? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, so the biggest thing about privacy policies, sort of put it another way that we found, was um, quite often that page would exist. Um, quite often that page would be sort of a copy and paste of something from many years ago. Um, so they don't ever have to be anything if that's where it was going. And I think what we've perpetuated is, is probably perpetuated, I think, is the word. Um, is, uh, the American slang of that word, I think, is, is that I think we just copy and paste what everyone else has. Because your privacy policy could be, uh, we sell your names to other organizations. Um, we do not store anything securely. Like, it's, it's a statement of what you do, right? And so what you often do is you go to a charity website, and it is 3,000 points. But it's only because they went to, like, the law society and thought, hey, they must have a good privacy policy. I have no idea what it says, but I'll copy, paste, and change the name. I'm done. And, and again, that's another opportunity where you could have been human. To be like, hey, what is our policy around data and security? Let's write it down in human language. All right, so I will try and step around the landmine question, which is, what does the person who works for a marketing agency that builds custom fundraising landing pages <laughs> think about third-party tools? Um, uh, let me see. Uh, one of the biggest things is it used to be very, very expensive to um, do e-commerce, right? And so I'm going to buy such and such cart or an organization founded in the year 2000 got head start on e-commerce and they're a very large charity to boot. And you know, that's another word for, um, and, and so it was very effective for a lot of very tiny organizations to deal with the e-commerce problem with their giving to use a third party tool because presumably they're using all the best practices. Um, that's not necessarily true, um, and it's not necessarily true that it's incredibly expensive because you probably have a, a volunteer form, and then when we talk about a donate form, then all of a sudden we're thinking, what major multi-million dollar company should we work with? Um, and, and I think the thing is, that I've learned, is that it's a series of very small steps that you do to optimize your giving. And if you can't control er every element, like I saw a tweet, like, oh, hey, can we uh, get rid of this page, um, this large charity helping organization? And like, well, we're not going to change it for you, right? Like, you know, we'll put it in our development cycle, and hopefully 9 to 12 months from now, this will improve. Uh, like, with Canada Helps, I was like, please have a branded page, which they, which they do. Someone mentioned that they have a very unbranded experience early. I asked them about that in 2009. And then, then in, in fall 2014, yes, it happened. But that took a very long time, and there was hundreds of charities and hundreds of millions of dollars when it was an unbranded experience. And, and so that, that's my somewhat political answer to I hate third-party tools. Um, <clears throat> anyone else? Yeah, yeah, and, and so if it helps, like part of the communication like that Eli and, always ha Eli, Eli and I generally have is like, what if I'm not already a multi-million dollar charity and haven't sort of got the drug? Like, I don't see the big win of online yet. Uh, or like, just it isn't a, like a, my house is burning problem to have a donate page not exist right now. Um, like, I would have clients that email me and call me if it's been down for two hours. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so what would be the, the step one? And then again, what is the case for support? So this is fundraising language. Um, and uh, what, is, what does fifty dollars do? And you're talking about that as a group. Even like for today, what do we put on our donate page instead of radio button one, two, three, and four? Fifty dollars to two thousand, because you know those are not trivial differences, right? So just determining to say like, hey, just go to thirdpartycharity.org um, and donate fifty dollars. And every time you donate fifty dollars, there's less dirty water. And, and then maybe one day you'd say as a charity, hey, if you donate $50, a kid will go without dirty water for a year. And so your charity might not be at that state, but just try and even use some terminology in that way on the donate page. And then the, the other one being just killing content. And, and like as a small charity to get started, that's the best thing to have is a very simple website that very narrowly describes who you are. 
And then when you have 50 to 100 employees and multiple stakeholders, then you can, then, then you can battle around content. What I often find is a shame is when there is so much content for a, a nonprofit that isn't in a charity yet, that has no employees, and they just have like their charter of rights online. All right. Because as our IT works perfectly, less is better. And for those of you who don't know, Dieter Rams worked at Braun in the uh, mid-century modern era, and he inspired Johnny Ives, who works at uh, this company, uh, Apple, and, and a lot of the initial design around the iPhone was around the Braun razors, you might know, because the ideas that Dieter Rams had led to Johnny Ives, and most of you now have to change your mobile sites because we got so hooked on <laughs> these phones thanks to this guy inspiring Johnny Ives so much. So. 